reminds me of the, the last half of Romans chapter 7 and the, the struggle yeah. of sin in the believer's life and that battle. So if you haven't read chapter 7 of, of Romans, I would encourage you to go listen or go read chapter 7 of Romans and read about Paul and the struggle with sin. And that song that reminded me of that. Whew, man, I'm got to be honest, I'm a bit nervous. Um, but uh, before I begin, I, I have this week in preparation, I wanted to prepare. Uh, this is something that I've been on my heart since the beginning of my journey. Um, but I wanted to prepare more for this this week than any other week in my life. And wouldn't you have it, I ended up with jury duty on Monday. And most people know here that I'm a police officer, detective with, with HPD and our um, vehicular crimes division. And uh, so I thought for sure. I mean, all my police officer friends, they were all like, dude, as soon as they see you and they know that you're a cop, you're gone. And uh, even the defense attorney, when they were polling for the jury, they asked, they asked me as a police officer what I did. And I told them, you know, I, I work uh, vehicular-related murders and, and fatalities, which this case happened to be a murder case. So I thought, surely the defense is not going to pick me to be a jury on a murder trial, seeing as my profession and what I do. Yep, I was picked that day. All this week, I've been on jury duty. I've been in a, in a jury room all week. So preparation for this was very limited is what I'm getting at, which leads me to believe two things. One, someone didn't want me prepared for tonight. And the more important thing, someone doesn't want you to hear what we're going to talk about tonight. And that's Satan. Does not want what we've got tonight. Before I begin, I'd like to do an example, or I'd like to do a little exercise or whatnot with some of the, the teens that I taught in, uh, in Trek. Have, we've gone through this example before, but I just want to soften your hearts if I can. Um, we all know the Ten Commandments, and I'm going to start with, we'll just, we'll just say lying, because we all know every single one of us has told a lie in our lives. Um, and, and, you know, and if I've taught you before, you know that I move around. And I can be long-winded, so y'all might not get, you know, food or anything. <laughs> but um, we'll start with lying. If I were to lie to my child or children, what would happen to me? Not much, if it, anything really, right? If I were to lie to my wife, I would probably be on the couch or in the doghouse, right? If I were to lie to my boss... I may be out of a job, or I may lose pay, or something to that effect, right? If I were to lie to the government, I may find myself imprisoned. Perjury is a crime. Imprisoned for a long time, potentially, depending on how bad the lie was. So, if I were to lie to an eternal God who lives on in eternity... What would my punishment need to be? Because if we've looked, the degree of authority over your life, as you go and increase in authority, the punishments get more severe, do they not? So if I'm lying and an eternal God, an eternal just God, a holy God, a loving God, demands punishment for sin, then your punishment would be an eternal punishment. Now, he has provided a way for an eternal sacrifice for your punishment. And that's very important. But I want you to think about something. I want you to think about your sin while we talk about this tonight. Um, I got a question. 
Brother Zach mentioned on Wednesday night, all week I've been praying for a definition, an analogy, if you will, actually, as to what what is faith. I wanted an analogy. I've been praying, God, give me a good analogy that I can give to you guys to help better understand it. And when you have it, God answered my prayer. On Wednesday night, when Brother Zach came up here, some of you may have been in here and heard it. And I told him I was going to use it because that that was an answered prayer. But we're going to get into that. What is faith? Simply put, it's trusting in something or someone. If you go to Hebrews chapter 11, I want you to write down Hebrews chapter 11 because I want you to go to Hebrews chapter 11 eventually, not tonight, but the entire chapter of Hebrews 11 is devoted as an example of what genuine faith looks like. Example after example after example, it goes on. And this person believed God, so they did this. And Noah believed God, and God told Noah to build an ark, So he did. The point in that is, with their belief, they believed God, and then they took action. So the example, the analogy that I was looking for, that Brother Zach came and and gave us, it was perfect. If I were to tell you that this building, this church building, were on fire right now, what would you do? If you believed me. If you believed me, if you trusted what I said, you'd probably be running out this building, right? So if you trust what I say, you'd be running out this building. That's an action. That's legitimate trust. That is faith. You are believing me that this building is on fire, and you're taking an action because of that belief. I want you to think about that sin in your life. And this definition of trust, because some of you in this room may be in grave danger. And the analogy holds serious weight in more ways than one, because you are in a burning building, in a sense. And, and you, you may very well be in some grave danger. The scarier part of that is you may not even know it. And I'll get to that in a minute as well. Um, When I was a kid, I used to watch a bunch of old shows. One of them, it was called Dragnet. Um, Probably some of the older folks would know, but you guys probably don't have any idea what Dragnet is. (sighs) But uh, Sergeant Joe Friday would always have this quote from it, just the facts, ma'am. And... Being as I'm a detective, I really like facts um, because I, I find facts are evidence of objective truths. What is objective truth? Um, nowadays, you guys live in a, well, we live in, so, in a postmodern era where someone's truth is their truth and someone else's truth is their truth. That's subjective. There is no objective truth this world would would tell you. But I'm telling you that there is someone who has come down from heaven to this earth and has claimed to be the way, the truth, and the life. There is objective truth, and that's why I like facts. But I want to give you some facts tonight on the person that we're going to speak on. I'll just go ahead and tell you. We're, We're going to talk about James. Um, James, the half-brother of Christ, is what we're going to talk about. But I want to lay out some some facts about James that you may not have known. Um, The first fact that I want to give you guys actually comes from an extra-biblical source. This is not in the Bible. Uh, His name is Josephus. And Josephus was a, a, a Jewish historian. He was born about four years after Christ's death. And he was a first century Jewish historian um, that recorded uh, the Jewish, hi- Jew- Jewish history at the time and during the Roman uh, conquest of Jerusalem in, from 66 to 70 AD. But many scholars today use Josephus and his historical writings uh, because he, 
he was just a historian. He just reported facts. The interesting thing about Josephus for us is this. In a court of law setting, which I know very well, we would treat Josephus as what we call a, uh, a hostile witness. And what a hostile witness is, is someone who actually, they don't agree, they don't believe what you believe. They are against what I believe. But we treat the, we have a hostile witness, they're going to proclaim facts that they have no skin in the game. They've got no reason to lie. They've got no bias. Like we would have a bias here. But he says some things about the half-brother of Christ, and I think that they're, they're really important. And this is, this is from his excerpt. This is not the full, full, uh, his full quote from his, from his writings, but I just want to read it to you real quick. Um, and Annas thought with Festus dead and Albinus still on the way, he would have the proper opportunity. Convening the judges of the Sanhedrin, he brought before them the brother of Jesus, who was called the Christ, whose name was James, and certain others. He accused them of having transgressed the law and delivered them up to be stoned. So, some of the facts here. The Sanhedrin is what we would know here in the United States. It would be our Supreme Court. The Sanhedrin was the Supreme Court, basically, of the Jewish nation of, of, of Israel. And those men there, Festus, Albinus, some of them you've actually heard of in the Bible, but what he's saying is they were convening the judges of Sanhedrin and they brought before them the brother of Jesus who was called the Christ. Now see, this is where that whole hostile witness thing comes in. He said he's called the Christ, not that he is the Christ. Right? So he doesn't believe what we believe, but he's affirming a fact for us. He's affirming that James is the, ha or is the brother of Jesus, and he's also affirming that Jesus, or that James and certain others, other Christians, uh, were accused of transgressing the law, and they delivered them up to be stoned. And this was about 62 AD, uh, that James, the half-brother of, of Christ, was stoned and martyred for the faith. That is huge. That's a huge point. Um, for our faith in apologetics, this is massive. Uh, this is something that strength, should strengthen our faith and, 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 uh, and help us. Here's some more facts. James was a pillar of the early church. And even Paul, on multiple occasions, mentions seeking out James to confer with him regarding the gospel and doctrines. Multiple times through Paul's epistles, multiple, several of them, he mentions that he goes back to Jerusalem and speaks with Cephas, Peter, uh, and James, the brother of our Lord is how Paul says it. But So Paul, and we all know Paul has written a third of the New Testament almost. Here he is, he's going back to speak to James, the half-brother of Jesus who is leading the church there in Jerusalem. So he's, he's a pillar of the early church, this James. Some more facts about James. There's no doubt that James, being the half-brother of, of Jesus, that he grew up with Jesus. He knew Jesus very well. He knew there was something different about Jesus. He even witnessed miracles from Jesus. Um that he had performed. You think about this for a moment. If you, if your, your brother or sister was claiming to be the Messiah, you would have dirt on them already. Every single one of you knows something about your brother or sister. No, you can't be. I've seen you sin. I've seen you do this. I've seen you do that. James was stoned. He died for his testimony of Christ. You're going you're gonna to die for, for someone you know is not the Son of God? I'm not. And he didn't either. But what if I told you that James was not always a believer? What if I told you that James, for the most part, 
was lost and dead in his sins? What if I told you that he didn't even know it? James was in grave danger, and he didn't even know it. Let's go to John chapter 7, verses 1 through 5 is where we're going to read. This isn't the, the full body of our text, but this is just, I'm going to prove to you, I'm going to show you that James wasn't a believer. And yet, not yet anyways. <clears throat> After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry, because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence and go into Judea, that the disciples may also see the works that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. For neither did his brethren believe in him. And that was all his brothers. That wasn't his disciples. The disciples have made a distinction there. That was his brothers. They did not believe in him. And they're fact, in fact, right there, if you look, for there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these, if you, if thou do these things, show thyself to the world. If you can do these things, why don't you show everybody? He's mocking them. Just like the same, the same people that mocked Christ on the cross when they were saying, oh, if you're the Son of God, come down from there. Save yourself. They're mocking. They don't believe. This is James. Wait a second. How does one, and this is, this is John, this is John chapter 7, this is, this is the beloved disciple here, John, is recording this in John chapter 7. If you go before all that, before this moment in time, there has already been miracle after miracle after miracle that Jesus has performed. And yet, they're still not believing. They're not, they don't believe what he's come here to do. So, I ask myself this question. What makes James go from being a mocking non-believer to being one of the most strongest pillars of the early church, willing to give his life for the, the testimony of Christ in Jerusalem, the same people that put our Savior on the cross, they're all right there still. And here's James willing to be stoned for the testimony. What makes somebody who's seen miracles, who knows that his brother, his half-brother, there's something different about Jesus all his life. He's got to know this. And something happens. I think we, we know the answer to this. The, the answer is found in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 7. I'm going to turn there. If you want to turn there, you can. I'm going to go ahead and read it all because I think 1 through 7 here anyways. Because this is the gospel that Paul was given for us. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I have preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, He was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto the present, but some are fallen asleep. And then verse 7. After that, He was seen of James then of all the apostles. So we've got unbelieving James who's been walking next to Jesus all his life. Walking next to Him. Knows about His history. That Christ is, there's something different about my brother. I've seen Him do miracles. Unbelieving James. 
And now he's the pillar of the church, willing to die for the faith. I think our answer there is in verse 7. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. So, he saw the risen Savior. And all of these disciples, they all have different stories in the sense of where they came from, their backgrounds and whatnot. But one thing changed them, and that was the resurrection of Christ. Jesus rose from the dead, and this man was willing to die for that testimony. So, if James, who's an unbeliever, and became converted through the risen Savior, I believe it's safe to say that we can trust what he has to say concerning faith. And who and what should be the object of that faith? Because he knows what it's like to be an unbeliever, to be deceived. And then he knows what it's like on the other side, to have genuine, true faith. So let's turn in our, our Bibles tonight to James chapter 2. <clears throat> Excuse me. Come on, Robert. <laughs> I didn't mean to call you out like that. Or maybe I did. James, chapter 2, we're going to start in verse 14. But the, the first 13 verses before this is actually pretty... Uh, interesting too and we'll talk about it a little bit but I'm going to go ahead and get into it what doth it profit my brethren though a man say he hath faith and have not works can faith save him if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food and one of you say unto them depart in peace be ye warmed and filled notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body what doth it profit even so faith if it hath not works is dead being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show you the, my faith by my works. Verse 19 here, you need to pay attention to big time. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou, O vain man, that faith without with Excuse me, but wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest how that faith wrought with works, and by works was faith made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. The whole theme right here, he's talking about what genuine faith looks like. Genuine faith, genuine trust has actions with it. They come with it. Like I said, when you get a chance, go read Hebrews 11. And that includes the motives of your heart. They talked about, James talked about there, you know, one of the examples, if you see someone, you see, you, you see someone that was in need and destitute of food, and clothing, and you could meet that need for them, but you say, go, be in peace, you know, basically, what you hear sometimes, I'll be praying that God meets your need, but you have the ability to meet that person's need, and you do nothing, what does it profit them? It does nothing for them, and you could have met their need. The greatest need that everyone needs in the world, especially around you, if you are a genuine believer, is the gospel. Amen. And you could meet that need, but have you? If you 
truly believe, if you are born again, truly believe, why aren't you meeting that need? The greatest need? I don't, I care not for food or water or clothes. Their eternity is on the line. Why aren't you telling them? Or handing them a track? Or inviting them to church? It boils down to is this. Just like in verse 19, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. The devils know. The devil knows God. He knows all about him. And yet he's still in open rebellion against him. You can have a mental acknowledgement that there is a God. You can even acknowledge that Jesus Christ lived on this earth. You can believe that he even did wonderful works. But until that mental knowledge that you may have hits your heart in a way that shows you that you are dead in your sins and lost without Christ and that His sacrifice, His work, is the fulfillment of the one true God, until you've placed your faith, your trust in that, for the remission of your sins, then you don't have genuine faith. Or at least you don't have genuine faith in the object or person of Christ and His finished work. Then you don't have faith in the right thing. So, my last point, and it's, it's my testimony. James was in grave danger and he didn't know it. And this is James, he was a he was a Jew, a good Jew. Everyone they called him James the Just. Um and yet he was an unbeliever. He was um he was converted when he saw his brother, his half brother, Christ rise from the dead, and he became a pillar. So, if he could have been deceived and lost, and oh, if, by the way, go read James chapter one. He talks about deception too. You might you might want to look into that as well. I love the book of James, y'all. It's transformative. I my own testimony in my life, especially these past couple of years as a Christian. James, the book of James is powerful for it for transformation. I, I promise you, you can't do the things on your own. Just like the song said, like he was up here singing, you need help from a higher power to get rid of the works of the devil because the work of the devil has been working in you from the moment you started sinning. You've been a work of the devil. Christ was sent here to destroy the works of the devil. That's sin. My own testimony. I love the book of James. I love James. And the reason why is because there's parallels in my own life with James. Um, just to talk a little bit about myself. I grew up, I'm, I'm Brother Stone's son. If anybody didn't know that, I'm Pastor Stone's son. I'm his youngest son. Um, so I grew up in this church. Uh, I could spout off all the verses you could ever teach or learn in Awanas and Sunday school. I sang all the songs. I still know them. I prayed prayers that everyone prayed. I was a good kid. In fact, my, my parents would probably tell you I was their best kid. The seven of my brothers and sisters would probably disagree, but I think I was the best kid. But by all accounts, I was a, a good kid, at least by man's standard. Um, I was really good. I didn't get in fights. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't do a whole lot of bad things. And uh, I joined the Army when I was 17. Uh, you know, 
doing good things for your country. Oh, what a, what a good kid doing great things, so patriotic, whatever. It's all vanity. Um, when I got out from the rule of my parents, when I was on my own, as time went on, I started to realize something. I was going through something in my life that had softened my heart enough to where he could rise through the deafness. I was going through some serious issues in my life. And then I thought, and I looked back on some of the things that I had been doing, drinking alcohol like crazy, anything you guys can imagine someone in the, in the, in the service would do, I was doing it. That wasn't really the problem. The problem was this. It didn't bother me. None of that bothered me. But my heart was soft enough one day I was driving home from work and uh, I, just, I asked myself this question. Why doesn't this bother me? And I believe the Holy Spirit hit me like a man, a freight train. It's because you're lost. You are lost. You are dead in your sins. That's why this doesn't bother you. These sins don't bother you because you're lost. And I can't tell you whether it was an outward cry or an inward cry. That I don't recall. But fortunately for me, I knew the gospel message. I'd heard it all my life. So I knew exactly what I needed to do in that moment. And I did it. I cried out to the... I cried out to Christ. I, I cried out to Jesus to save me from my sins. I cried out to Him. Just like it talks about in, I believe, Romans 10. Call upon the name of the Lord and thou shalt be saved. You guys, I'm telling you right now, if you call upon the name of the Lord because you know that you are lost and you are a sinner and you are dead in your sins, He will save you because His Word is truth. And he cannot lie. And then the tears started flowing. I, I got home. I'm, it, was, it was amazing. I knew, I knew that I had been changed. And from that moment, things began to change in my life. Sins started to bother me. Now, I wouldn't, I'd be lying if I sat here and I told you, oh, I became this perfect holy person I wish that I was but like we talked about earlier like the song was talking about in Romans 7 now you just realize you're finally real you come into the realization that you're now in the fight you're in a spiritual battle for your soul and Satan doesn't want you to get close to God to remove the works that he had created in your life. And slowly but surely, I was about 25. I'm 37 now. I've only been a Christian for about 12, 13 years. This was October of 2008 is when this happened. But the works of Satan from that moment on began to get knocked down by the Lord. And as I developed a more personal relationship with Christ and I grew in the grace and knowledge of Christ through his word and his conviction, he has helped me tear down sins that I have dealt with all of my life. But I sit here and I tell you guys, some of you may be in grave danger and you don't even know it. And the reason I say that is because James was, is because me, a preacher's kid, I did all these good things. I was my own God. You see, that was my problem. I'm a good... And when you encounter unbelievers out there that you're trying to witness to, what's going to happen is they're going to... Well, I'm good. I do these good things. I think my good outweighs my bad. That's how I was too. Oh, I'm good. I do... I, I read my Bible. I, I, I learn the scriptures. I, I, I sing the songs, you know. 
when I was by myself and out on my own, out from the rule of my parents, I did none of those things. Why? Because I was God. In my heart, in my mind, I had made an idol of myself. I can do what I want. That was my problem. And until that moment that I realized that I was lost, nothing was going to change until he changed me and began that good work in me. So what I want to challenge you guys is to consider your faith. Consider your trust. What was it in? What is it in? Mine was, I had faith. I had my parents' faith. God, it wasn't my own. It was borrowed. It wasn't mine. Because the moment that I got out from the rule of them, I had no faith. I had no trust in it. I, I, I take that back. I had trust in me that I had good works. I was good. I did these things. That was where my faith is. Until the moment that I cried out to Jesus to save me from those sins. If you are here and you know that you have not called upon the name of the Lord, if you have not trusted Christ as your Savior, if sin doesn't bother you, you've got a problem and you're in grave danger. And you may not know it. I'm hoping that these words tonight will help you know it, that you're in danger and that there is something you can do about it. It's not the last hope. One last thing and I'll be through. As a vehicular homicide detective, and I work all the fatals in this city, you hear our, our pastors, they talk about it, our teachers talk about it too all the time. They say, well, if you, if you die tonight, do you know where you'd go? They talk about death all the time. And I remember as a teenager, I ain't worried about that. I wasn't worried about it. What I do in life, I have the it's not pleasant. Um, I see death almost every night that I work. I've, by now, I've done this seven years. I've probably seen thousands of people dead and die from traffic crashes. Um, it just so happens that you live right now at least close to or if not in Harris County. The city that we're in right now, this is one of, if not the worst and deadliest county in the nation for fatal crashes. The thing about these fatal crashes is this. It's not like, oh, well, that person was doing something bad and they got killed as a result. Most of these crashes, that's not the case. Most of the time, someone is doing bad. They're breaking the law. And it's the innocent party that dies in that crash. And I'm telling you that I've seen from a nine-month-old baby to a 90-year-old woman die and everything in between. The vast majority of people that I see die are between 18 and 24, somewhere in that range. Some of you are getting to that level in your life, that age. Death's coming for you. It is. Um, the crash pulse. I download the black box of all these crashes. And if you can blink your eye real quick just to get a give an example, just blink your eyes a couple times. That's 300 milliseconds. That's how long it takes you to blink your eyes, 300 milliseconds. When I download the black boxes of everybody involved in these crashes, the innocent party that are involved in these crashes, when I download the black box, I record where the actual crash pulse happens. And the part that kills them, this crash happens between 150 and 200 milliseconds. That person is dead and gone within half the time it takes you to blink your eyes. So if you think tonight that I'll get right later in life when I'm done having my fun, you're not going to have time. It's going to be over. You'll be dead and gone before you had that chance to repent and place your trust in Christ who willingly came here, and that's the tragedy of it. He came here for you. He pursues you. He pursued me.
Jesus sought me as a stranger, wandering from the fold of God. He, to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. It's one of my favorite songs. It is my favorite song. That part right there, that he rescued me from danger. He did that day back in 2008. He rescued me from danger. From what? From the works of the devil. From sin. From the sin that I had just continuously did in my life and it didn't bother me until that moment. And I became a changed person. Just like James. James was different when he recognized that Christ was the Savior, the Son of God, who came and died and rose again. And that changed him. Just like it changed me. Just like it can change you. I promise you it will change you. There will be a change in your life when you come to know Christ as a Savior. I guarantee it. And that's all I have, brother. Well, I'm thankful for what I've heard tonight. I'm thankful for what you have heard tonight. And you probably have a lot to think about. Or, or maybe there's someone tonight and you don't have any more thinking to do. It's something has hit your heart and you realize what you need. You know, you need salvation. And as I think about the Lord's salvation and, and how he draws us and we come to a place where we can trust him, so many delay. Why, why do people delay being saved? Well, some people think they need to know more. And I just want to tell you tonight that all you need to know is that you're a sinner, that Jesus Christ died for your sins, and if you trust him, he'll give you eternal life. That's all I knew when I got saved. I didn't grow up in church. That's, that's all I knew. And that's all it took for me to be saved. Some people will delay because they have a thought in their mind that they're going to walk away and try to become a little bit better person to present themselves to God. And that there is no need of that. There is nothing biblical about that. You come to Jesus just as you are. You've come into this room with sins tonight, maybe on your own. You haven't confessed them to the Lord or, or you see by those things you're guilty. And, and as you are, Jesus will save you tonight. That's why he came. That's why he lived. That's why he died, was buried and raised again. You know, there are some people that that, that hear this and then they say, well, I'm a lot better person than most people. And I think I have to be good with God. Pride will cause someone to delay. It may be that someone is delaying because they're having fun with sin. And you're thinking you don't want to let go of sin, but it's a high price to pay. If you have some fun with it now and do get saved down the road, there could be consequences in the rest of your life or the rest of my life for the sins that we commit. Though, though our penalty would be paid for, you're still suffering from some of those things. You know, some people are, are scared. I've heard that many times. They, they have this moment of being scared and they delay. And I'd just like to say tonight that you don't have to be scared because you are not going to be rejected by Jesus if you realize you're a sinner and you need to be saved by him. He has done everything that you need. He supplied everything that you need. Why are some people scared? Maybe do you look around and think, if I say this, if, if I come forward, if I do this, People are going to think I've been a bad person. Well, you know what? There's not one good person except for Jesus. And we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. The church would be thrilled if you trusted in Jesus as your Lord and Savior tonight. I would do a cartwheel if I could. If you were saved tonight. 
There's, there's some reasons why people delay. Why, why shouldn't people delay? Why you shouldn't delay? Well, Brother Jason touched on a lot of it. Death isn't going to delay. Death is coming. And it's coming any day. Why, why would you not delay? Because God doesn't delay. He says today is the day of salvation. He's provided everything you need. And you can trust him tonight. Why delay no longer? Because sin hurts. It hurts. There's temporary pleasure. And then there's a lot of hurt that comes from it. Why not delay? Because Jesus is coming soon. And when Jesus comes back, he's getting all of those who have trusted in him. And he's taking us home to be with him. Would you be one of those tonight? I ask you not to delay tonight. If you're being convicted and you realize that you're a sinner. And that Jesus died for your sins. You're invited to trust him tonight. Would you trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? We're going to have a a time of invitation. And this is a time for you to come ask any questions. And I would love to share with you from the word of God. The, the answer to those questions. And how you can be saved. And so we're going to go to the Lord in a word of prayer. And this, this is time that, that God wants to do business with your heart. I, I believe he has your attention tonight. And... And he wants to save your soul if you're not saved. For the, for the child of God here, he, he wants to show you newer and greater things to be more serious about him. So let's pray and then you obey God tonight and do business with him. Father, we do bow before you tonight. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for the power of your truth, that you're mighty to save. And you are in our midst tonight. And you are working on our hearts. And I thank you for what you want for us. For what you have for us. The greatest life we could possibly have. I thank you for the miracle of salvation. To save a sinner. And to make us to become more like you. And so Lord in, in this time of invitation. Have your way with your people. And may they obey you with an open heart tonight. And we ask these things in Jesus name. Amen. If everyone would please stand.